Camille began working as a special assistant to President Barack Obama and Director of Communications for Ms. Mrs. Michelle Obama in January of this year, 2009. So, as I said before, it is my personal pleasure as her aunt to welcome her back to Sacred Heart, and as a teacher, certainly to welcome her home to her place on the Hill. So please join me in welcoming my niece, Camille Johnston. Thank you very much, Rose, for that very nice introduction. Rose and Joe, my Uncle Joe, were really the reasons I were here, I'm were. i here today. Uh, Joe called me up and asked me if I would do this, and I said, of course. I also want to thank Sisters Carolyn and Sister Celeste and all the faculty for welcoming me back. Huge honor to be here and so proud. And congratulations to Samantha and Nicole. Really great speeches. Um, I can't believe Mrs. Sadler isn't here for this. <laughs> I just can't believe that happened, being that she really is the earliest inspiration for my love of politics and service. I come from a family of Catholic liberal Democrats, and I have to admit that for most of my time here at Sacred Heart, I was pretty unaware that I was in the minority here. <laughs> but I think it was because I knew Mrs. Sadler and I were on the same team, and that's kind of all that mattered to me. Mrs. Sadler was involved in a peace and justice group here in the area, as was my grandmother. And I knew at the time that fighting for social justice was a way of living my faith, of putting my faith in action. And I respect and appreciate Mrs. Sadler so much for providing that type of example and leadership. I am certain that it played a huge part in my choice of careers. This is the third commencement speech that I've written this year, but it is the first one I've ever written for myself and I've honestly had a hard time deciding what it is important to say. You want it to be funny, but you don't really want it to sound like Bridget Jones' diary, even if you realize that part of you resembles her. <laughs> you want it to be honest and reflect your life, but you don't want it to be too introspective, but it'll sound like maybe you should go to see a therapist. <laughs> and you want it to be important, but not feel preachy, or seem like you think you have all the answers. In some ways, I feel like I've given a version of this speech every day for the last 40 years, which is the first time I became a sister. I'm the oldest of five kids, and truth be told, I've been responsible since the day I was born. <laughs> I've heard of some oldest children rebelling against this, but my parents did an amazing job of letting each of us know how lucky we were every time a new baby was born, because it meant we had someone new to love. And we do love each other. I rarely go a day without speaking with several of my three sisters and my brother. Each of them has lived with me at some point in our lives, either in Washington, D.C., or New York, or L.A. Everywhere I went, someone wanted to come with me, except when I went to Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> no one wanted to come there. As a result, they've all had to listen to me tell them what they should or shouldn't do. Now, you aren't my siblings, even though one of you is my cousin. Emily, I'm very proud of you. And in the spirit of Sacred Heart Sisterhood, there are a couple of things that I've shared with them that I'm happy to pass on to you. First of all, in a place like Sacred Heart, so very small in comparison to other high schools, you develop some wonderful relationships. These relationships will be important to you forever, even though you may not remain, remain friends with everyone you are friendly with now. However, how people perceive you and what they remember of you will always be important. And how you begin relationships and how you nurture them or end them is what people will remember. I moved to Washington, D.C. in 1991, about a year after I graduated from UCLA. We were five girls living in a three-bedroom apartment on Capitol Hill. This is where the Bridget Jones Park could come in. <laughs> One of the other girls in the apartment was working for Senator Tom Harkin's presidential campaign, and she said they were looking for someone in the press office. I interviewed with the Senator's communications director, Lorraine, and she hired me on the spot. I was very excited, despite the fact that she told me she could not pay me for the first three months. <laughs> I called my dad, and he agreed to cover my bills for me. I mean, realize now what a luxury that was. I worked really hard for Lorraine, and I loved working for her. She was calm, funny, smart, and well-respected. She did not take herself too seriously, and the reporters loved her, and she was willing to teach me how to do the job. I wanted to be just like her. She gave me one rule to follow. I was not to be quoted on the record when I provided information to reporters. 
One day I came in to do the press clips. I had to get there very early in the morning and search through all the newspapers to find anything written about the senator. This was way before we had access to the internet or Google. As I was going through the Boston Globe, I saw my name in one of the stories. The senator's diet consists of fish and pasta, according to Camille Johnston. I thought for sure I would be fired. I went in and showed Lorraine, and she laughed, of course, and said, don't let it happen again. Lorraine has been a reference for me for every job I have applied to since. We have gone years without speaking, but we always pick up where we left off. She was on the selection committee when I was asked to apply to be Mrs. Obama's communications director. Lorraine knows my work ethic, my reputation, my personality, and she has for nearly 20 years. I am where I am because I worked really hard for Lorraine, my first boss in Washington. Your reputation follows you forever, and that can be a very good thing. Secondly, you will take jobs for lots of different reasons in your life, but money should be the least of them. When you work solely for a paycheck, you resent the job and the people you work with and your boss, and you end up not being a very good employee or very happy. Money solves lots of problems, and there are times in your life when taking a job because of the money will be the right and responsible thing to do. But, you have a if, but if you have a choice, take a job you want to do. There's a personal sense of satisfaction that comes from doing a job that you love that you can never get from doing a job simply for a paycheck. There's a sense of accomplishment and joy one gets when you know your work has made a difference. In 1999, I was working as the head of communications for the CBS television station. I'd been there for two years and I was making really good money and I worked nine to five. A little bored, but not ready to leave. And out of the blue, I got a call from Tipper Gore's chief of staff, asking if I wanted to be considered for the position of communications director. I was floored. I'd worked on the 92 and 96 campaigns, but really had been out of the loop for a while and wasn't quite sure when they were calling me. Turns out I'd been recommended by several people, including Lorraine. I got the job, a huge pay cut, a 24-hour-a-day schedule. I traveled with Tipper to three cities a day, five days a week for two years. In the end, someone figured out we were making about 70 cents an hour. <laughs> My first day as communications director for Tipper was the day of the Columbine shootings in Littleton, Colorado. That week, we went to New Hampshire to talk to high school students. Tipper asked the students if they knew anyone who had thought about suicide. Lots of hands went up. She asked them if people were getting help, and the students all said no one would ask for help at school because they were afraid of being labeled. On the flight home that day, Tipper told me she'd been treated for depression and she wanted to tell everyone about it so that the stigma for getting help would be eradicated. It was very brave. Her husband was about to launch his presidential campaign, but she was determined. A couple of weeks later, we did an interview with USA Today and Tipper's announcement was on the front page of the paper. Everywhere we went for the next two years, people came up to Tipper and thanked her. Their husbands or wives, sons or daughters, mothers or fathers, brothers or sisters or friends had battled depression. Some had lost. And they wanted to thank her for taking away some of the shame associated with mental health illnesses. My work for Tipper will always be one of my proudest professional moments. Not only because she's a wonderful person, wonderful person who has handled herself with such grace, but also because I'm so proud of helping change how mental health issues are dealt with among families. And this leads to my third point. I thought working for Tipper would be the high point of my professional career. As I was writing this speech, it was pointed out to me that today's graduates were only eight or nine when the 2000 presidential election ended. <laughs> so you might not really be aware of how polarizing this campaign was and how bizarre the ending was. Never, be, never before had the Supreme Court stepped in to decide a presidential election. For those of us working for Vice President Gore, it was a brutal and devastating ending, historically, professionally, and personally. Had Vice President Gore become president, I would have continued to serve in the White House. Instead, I was out of work and had assumed that I'd reached the pinnacle of my professional career when I was only 33. I did not know where I would go or what I would do that would ever match my work in the White House. And honestly, my interest in public service and politics and government was gone. I left Washington with no intention of ever going back. It just goes to show you that life is full of unexpected surprises. And that's my third point. I truly cannot believe that I'm working in the White House for President Mrs. Obama and in this historic administration. I played no role in the campaign, and I did not know Mrs. Obama or anyone who worked for her. I was living in LA, far away from the political scene, and simply rooting for Obama from the sidelines. I left the Dodgers and was working as a consultant looking for a full-time position. 
My fiance and I had recently decided to not get married. I was trying to, hard to figure out what I was going to do to bring some joy back into my life. I tell you all the details for one reason. This is how life works. One day you're deeply hurt and struggling to find your footing, and the next someone calls you up and asks you to apply for a dream job. A dream job that you thought you had slipped away near, nearly a decade earlier. Every day I walk into the White House and I'm inspired to do my best work. And in this administration, that obligation is even more heightened. The Obama administration is the culmination of the struggle for equality and dignity for millions and millions of people and serves as a beacon of hope for millions more around the world. And I see this every day as I walk into my office in the east wing of the White House, which is also the visitor's entrance for tours of the residents. Elderly men and women dressed in their Sunday best, tears streaming down their faces. Veterans in their dress uniforms, some of them bearing the scars of their service as they are wheeled through the halls. Rowdy students being shushed into reference by their history or government teachers. Families in shorts and t-shirts, some of them cranky and sunburned, but taking pictures to remember this trip forever. And the African American men and women who have worked in the White House residence for decades as butlers and housekeepers and are now in their 70s that will not retire because they want to serve the first African American president and his family. Every day, I am grateful to be a part of it. There is a saying that the definition of luck is where preparation meets opportunity. I feel very lucky. I spent the years in between working for Mrs. Gore and working for Mrs. Obama in New York in the publishing industry and in LA in sports and entertainment. When I went for my interview with Mrs. Obama, I was nervous, but I realized everything I had done for the eight years in between had made me better prepared for this moment. I really knew in my bones that I would be able to do a good job for Mrs. Obama. I was more confident about taking this position than I had ever been about any job. At the end of the day, that is all you have to go on. Your own confidence, your own reputation, your own drive and ambition. And it's something that you build over time through all your hard work, all of the ups and downs, all the risks you take, and all the responsibilities you are willing to assume. No one can give you that confidence. It's your gift to you. And it does take time to build up this re reservoir that makes you comfortable in your own skin, that helps you live your life in the way you want to live it. But, and this is my final point, no matter how proud I am of my work with Mrs. Gore and now for Mrs. Obama, no matter how many great speeches I write or important moments of history I'm a part of, nothing will compare to how proud I am of having a good relationship with my parents, my siblings, my family, and friends. The older you get, the more you realize how little things actually mean to you and how much people and relationships do. You will lose loved ones. You will suffer heartbreaks. You'll lose jobs. You'll make plans that don't work out. You will have setbacks of one sort or another. But if you're a good friend, a good sister, a good daughter, a good mother, a good wife, a good neighbor, a good citizen, I don't believe you will ever be disappointed in yourself or your life. And that ultimately is the goal to find a way to live a life that makes you proud, that makes you happy. This will mean different things to each of you, and it will change as you grow older, but I guarantee in the end, what will matter most to you is the people you have loved and the people who love you. So congratulations and good luck.